Hey guys, Keith here. Um, just today, version 20, 2017 um, was released of x -Lights, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time going over um, the features and functions of that release um, and uh, primarily focus on the things that aren't the, um, the new AC mode. I'll, I'll record a separate video covering that. Um, the, this release is something I'd call more of an alpha release than a beta release. We know there are problems in it. In fact, this is my second attempt at recording this video because I just crashed it um, in a way that I shouldn't have been able to crash it. Um, but uh, one of the changes we've introduced um, obviously has a bug in it. Um, there's a couple of features in this release that are, that are somewhat experimental and I'm, I'm not entirely surprised that I did crash it. I wasn't expecting it, but not entirely surprised. So what I wanted to do was quickly go through and, and run through those features um, and, and give you an idea of what's in it. So let's quickly um, get a layout. Um, I've thrown a matrix down here in my aborted video. Um, let's go and create a sequence. Um, one thing that's different here, normally if you just click done here, um, it would try and create a musical sequence, but it wouldn't have a musical file and it'd have all sorts of dramas. Um, now you can just click done and it creates the 30 second animation sequence. Saves me one click when I'm testing. Um, so the first feature um, which is in the readme file is this one about bad value curves on sub buffers. And by now you'd all be very familiar with sub buffers and, and the concept of, um, I don't know, let's throw a bars effect down. Uh, let's make it a little bit more colorful. And we can go over here to halves and say, do this only in the left half and it constrains the, the amount of the matrix that's used. Um, but these things are fixed. So you, you can create them there, but they sit there for the entire effect. What we've added is there's always been the ability to edit. And what edit lets you do is define these yellow lines manually. So the top is 100 which is up here, 100 is the top of the, the uh, grid. Left is zero, which is the left-hand side. The bottom is zero, which is the bottom down here. And the right is 50 or halfway along. And if I was to make that, um, I don't know, 75 and click OK, it'd move across as you'd expect. Now the grid actually supports values from minus 100 to plus 200, enabling you to have actually a rendering surface that is much um, larger than the model. And that has the effect of zooming whatever effect it is that you put in. Now I actually tried to uh, make this oversize and it crashed on me and there's obviously a bug that I need to work on there. But let's go to edit here. And what if, um, uh, I actually wanted to change the size of this buffer over time. So what if this right, instead of going from zero to 75, I wanted it to actually start on the left and expand out across the matrix. And so what I can do is I can come in here and I can put a, a value curve in and I can put a, a ramp. And I need to set a starting point. Now, because as I said, it goes from minus 100 to plus 200, and I want to start it on the left here at the zero mark, I actually need to set this to 33. Now these edit fields here are now editable. I found the bug that was causing that to be a problem. So we're going to set it to between 33 and 67, which is one third and two thirds, which is exactly what you would expect. And then we're going to click OK. And click OK. And now you can see over the duration of the effect, the sub buffer changes, uh, causing the effect to expand on out. Now you can do some really interesting things with this. Um, uh, one of the things that I can do here is I can actually come up and uh, get the left hand one as well. And what I can do is I can say, yeah, I want this to be a ramp as well, but I want to ramp it from zero to 33. Okay. Now this is not going to look any difference at all on something like this, but if I was to get something like a movie effect and drop it down. Okay. And if I was to, um, sorry, if I was to come down here and browse for a movie, I think I have someone, I definitely do have one uh, in my lights. Uh, home, video, oh, I don't know. We'll pick something like this. 
And so what you see is it's actually going to slide the video in the video. Uh, I need to loop. And so what it's done is it's bought the video in. It's not stretching it. The video is actually full size, but it's starting off screen and it's sliding across until it fills the screen. And so you, you can see how using these uh, movable sub buffers now, you can start to move effects around. You can do certain types of transitions where you slide things in and out. Uh, you can zoom things out and so forth. So I'm hoping that gives you some new options and some things to explore. Um, but this one here, th this was open heart surgery. I, I had to make a number of changes to make this work. And as I said, this is the most likely change to cause crashes, including the one that I experienced while I was recording my first video, which I'll now have to go back and fix. Um, moving audio file loading to its own thread. Now, I've, to be honest, I've done this primarily for the scheduler. One of the things that frustrated me in the scheduler was that when I loaded a song, it would often pause for you know several seconds while it went away and loaded the audio file. And that's because there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to take uh, those audio files, convert them to constant bit rate, ready to be played. Um, over a year ago, we got rid of the need for you to pre-process all your audio files and put them into constant bit rate form. But the downside of that is that but um, uh, we had to do that work. Um, it should, in theory, make X lights load fractionally faster when you're loading a sequence. You probably won't notice it, but it's there. A couple of bugs here that I wanted to talk about. Most of them I'm skipping, but there's a couple I wanted to talk about. So we've talked about the fact that you can now, in that value curve dialog, actually type into the text boxes. That previously wasn't possible. I finally found what was going on there. Um, and export bulb counting. Um, so you would all be familiar that you can come up to here and you can export your models into a models file. And if uh, I go back to here, to my desktop, to my folder, it creates, Oh, I know where I put it in my videos folder. Hang on, we'll do that again. Uh, tools, export models. Um, yeah, see, so put it in the videos folder. Let's go back to our desktop. Uh, back into our folder here. Create a file called models. Doesn't matter if I spell it wrong, but I'll fix it. Okay, so there's the model CSV, and this will open up in Excel, and it will give you down here uh, your bulb count and your channel counts and everything else. Um, I've made some fixes to this, some things that weren't quite right that were generating unexpected results. Uh, these are estimates only. That there are lots of reasons why this can go wrong. Um, I do try to take into account, you know, duplicate models or um, you know shadow models and things like that, but I, I wouldn't swear by this number. The other thing that this can be, um, uh, the, particularly the bulb count can be elevated by is if you've got a, a dumb model of a star, so it's a single channel, but you've put 50 bulbs on it, and maybe it does or maybe it doesn't have 50 bulbs, and you don't really care in X-Lights, so it just looks like a star and that's all that you care about. Well, I will count those 50 as if they are bulbs. So although you've used one channel, I'll recognize that you said there were 50 bulbs on that star. So if you're using some AC elements like that, your bulb number can be somewhat inflated and you may want to use your number of channels and divide it by three or something. I don't know. Up to you. All right. Some changes. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Um, current estimation. Okay. So I've done that here, up here. Um, every load, every, sorry, every um, uh, LED uses a certain amount of current. Um, and I've used a fairly simple, I think it's 0.06, I think. Um, I can tell that equals, sorry, equals that divided by the number of lights. Yeah, 0.06 amps per um, LED. And so I've just done the multiplication for you and put it in there to say how much it is. Um, Look, this is what I've been told it is. I don't kind of believe it. It suggests to me, generally speaking, I need massive power supplies when I know I get away with a lot less. This also probably assumes you're running the whole thing at full white, and it probably explains why my show doesn't run very well at full white. Because um, at, uh, uh, at 12 volts, that's... Um, uh, yeah, 576 watts. So that's, that's a pretty large amount of power to run uh, a matrix, I guess. 
All right, so a couple of power supplies, which is probably possible. Although I run, I run a um, matrix which is at least that size with one. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's conservative. Um, a collapse or function in the row headings. So what that means is down here, you know, you can open up strands and nodes, and you know, there's all sorts of things that you can see here, etc. But uh, you know, in a big show with lots of models and you've opened things up, you wanted to just go and expand, uh, sorry, collapse everything. There's now this collapse all and that will just close everything up. So you're back at the model or the model group level here and you don't need to go back and do it all manually um, as some people have. Another bug, um, I did find a bug in the X schedule, which meant that uh, although I'd always advertised that you could play past midnight, it turns out that that didn't actually work. Um, I have now played it past midnight and got it working. So that one's all good. Uh, there was a bug reported. Um, so if I go, let's, uh, let's close this sequence. Um, so if I come in here now and I don't know, I drop a star. Whoops, let's drop a star. Um, I don't know, a circle or whatever it is. Okay, so you need, see now I've got model chaining here. And it used to be if I was to go and rename this star to, you know, I don't know, tree star or something, uh, the chain would break. Um, and I'd suddenly get the, that annoying pop-up saying, oh, you know, this, this thing doesn't work, and it would reset the start channel to one, which is what we do by default if we can't uh, resolve a, um, a start channel. But now what it's done is it's actually automatically gone in and corrected the reference here. So hopefully that means you'll get a lot less dialogues popping up. Uh, you'll still have problems when you're loading old sequences and you've changed model names, that stuff doesn't go away. Um, but at least hopefully it makes that process a little bit less painful. Um, okay, the E682 upload. So uh, you all uh, by now hopefully are familiar uh, with the concept that you can um, define all of your controller um, universes here and you can come up here and upload to controller. Well, it used to be um, that there was an E6804 here. It's now a more generic SAN devices. Um, I've tested this with the E6804 and the E682. Uh, there's an input definition which uploads the universes that it should listen to. And there's an output de definition which uh, configures the outputs to connect correctly to the universes that you've uploaded. Um, when you're doing this, I, I always strongly suggest if, there, if I have split it, and some of them are split like the Falcon and the SAN devices, some of them it's just a single upload like the PixLife and the J1Sys. And where it's a split one, I strongly recommend you do both. You upload the input definition and then you upload the output definition, particularly if there's any chance that you've changed something. Because um, there are some things, for instance, that the input definition of the Falcon does, such as putting your controller into universe start channel mode, um, that the output definition then relies on. And if it, you've changed it, and you try and upload it, it, it won't work. Now the SAN devices stuff, uh, I've done that with version four of the firmware. Um, I assume it may work with the five, I haven't tested it. Um, I guess I would have to upgrade the controller that I've got to version five and, and I haven't got around to that. So that one's outstanding. Um, maybe someone can test it and tell me if it works. A decaying sine wave value curve, so again, Let's drop an effect down here, which has a uh, value curve on it. And let's go in here. And you'd know for some time now, there's been a whole bunch of these different types and we've had a sine wave. Where's the sine wave gone? There it is, the sine wave. So we've had the sine wave for quite some time. Well, now there's a new one called a decaying sine wave. Um, and when you set the number of cycles, it becomes more obvious. So you've got a sine wave that fades away but keeps oscillating over time. Um, I don't know. Maybe that will be interesting or useful to you. Um, but I added it. Now, AC sequencing mode is something that Gil and I have been collaborating on. Um, it's there's no new effects or anything in it. It's, it's all old stuff. Uh, we've just changed the way you interact with them to try and make it um, much faster and more obvious. Um, and I'll come back and do another video to go through that in some depth. 
Uh, the reverse nodes in the submodel dialog. Um, so you'd be familiar with the submodel dialog here. What's that? 50. It's 10. So uh, if I go into submodels here, for instance, uh, there's a generate button here. So I'm going to go in and generate it. Um, but I'm going to use nodes and I'm going to make 10 of them. And what that should do, because there's 50 nodes here, I think it will create me with one submodel per um, side of the star, as it appears to have done, which is fine. Um, the problem is, is what happens if you want to reverse these? It's always a pain. And so I've added this reverse nodes button. If you click on it, it just swaps these around. Um, it'll work in any, if I go in here and add a row and I put, I don't know, one, two, and three in, or I put in um, one colon five colon two, comma two, sorry, and four to five, and I reverse the nodes, it will do that. It will flop, swip them all around. The four to fives became five to four. The two five one is now, not one five two is now two five one. The three two one was one two three. And so you can just flip them backwards and forwards without having to manually edit them. Um, I have contemplated whether I need to add a reverse on a per line basis. I don't know if someone's interested in that, let me know and I, I guess I could add it, uh, but I haven't at this point. Um, include some standard value curves in the distribution. Now, I can't actually see this in this version, so I'm actually running a, a version that out of my debugger. So let me kick up the one that just came that you would have installed or are considering installing. Uh, no. All right. Uh, what happens here? Yeah, I've got a matrix, that's cool. Um, so when you go and drop one of those value curves down again, and you click on here, what you will find now is there is a whole stack of curves down here that are all predefined for you that you can just click on as a very fast way to get access to them without having to go up here and play with all of the controls. And so, you know, this one here, I've optimized for um, using the sub buffers. So it's already set at between 33 and 66. Um, same with this one, right? It's a bit of a zigzag, but it's the same thing. And I've got both both of them that are that are offset. Um, again, possibly useful for setting some value curves on your sub buffers. Um, there's some other waves, etc. So lot, lots of lots of things here. Uh, you can actually create more of these if you click on export and you put it into the value curves dialog. Um, it should be available to you or in your show directory, it'll be available to you. Um, there is also within program files, X lights, a folder called value curves. And that's actually where all of these value curves are stored. And if you really wanted to in theory, you could go and put them in there as well. Um, obviously these are pre-distributed with the, the program. So hopefully that makes your life a little bit easier. Um, this one here I won't demo, but um, for some time now you've been able to upload your output configuration to the Falcon controllers, but when it came to your DMX or your LOR attached to the serial outputs on the Falcon controllers, uh, there's been no way to upload those. Um, now that uh, I have had a chance to actually power my, my F16 up, um, I've managed to, uh, to work out what I was doing wrong there and I fixed that and I believe it will work now. And the final one here is, is one that Gil's put in. Um, so by default, I'm pretty sure I'm still in default mode. There it goes. Um, if you double click up here, oops, no, that's not default mode. So the, he's added this new setting here called uh, timing double click mode. And in the past, it's been in this in this mode here where when you double click on here, it pops up with a label and you used to type lyrics in and the lyrics would appear and then you'd break them all down, etc. cetera. Um, and if you double click on an effect, uh, nothing happened. Um, now for some time now, you've been able to shift double click on an effect and it would select the portion of the, the timing track that that effect uh, occupied, but that was it. So what Gil's done is he's given you this option of putting it into play timing mode. And what that means is when you double click on this, it actually selects it and plays it. 
Um, so useful, particularly if you're doing uh, Papagayo and you just want to hear what that word sounds like, you can double click on it and, and play it. And I believe the same works for effects, it does. Um, now, if you still want to edit the text, obviously you need a way to do that. And you don't want to have to run back and, uh, and change it. And so that, in that case, you shift and double click and it will do the opening of the text box. Um, and you can switch it back at any time you'd like uh, to whatever mode it is that you prefer to be in. And that's it. So, so there are all the changes that are in release 20. I haven't covered the AC mode. I, I'll record a video in a moment and I'll go through that. As I said, look, most of those features are fine. Uh, the value curves on sub buffers, uh, definitely a, a reasonable amount of risk around that. And you'll almost certainly potentially experience a failure or two. Uh, report them, let us know, um, and we'll try and get them fixed. Thanks, guys.